Hello everyone, Interact back here again with another episode of Entity Education. In this episode, we're going to be covering Kazan Yamauka, probably better known as the Oni. As always, there will be timestamps up on the screen right now, and also down in the description below, as well as in the pinned comment, because I started being a responsible YouTuber, I guess. Before we get started, I just wanted to say yes, I have my game's language set to Japanese while recording the footage, because it only felt appropriate just like in the spirit video. And no, I don't know a single hiragana, katakana, or kanji, so I have no idea what any of it means, I just kind of have it all memorized because I have too much time in this game. The Oni has the same base stats as most other killers, a tear radius of 32 meters, and a base movement speed of 4.6 meters per second, or 115%. So let's talk about the Oni's power, Yamoka's Wrath. There are a lot of behind-the-scenes numbers, but honestly it's pretty simple once you get the hang of it. Let's start off with the obvious place, how to actually get Yamoka's Wrath charged up and ready to work. Let's first talk about some behind the scenes stuff that is required and not really talked about in the actual game. Firstly, to get Yamoka's Wrath fully charged up, you need 100 charges. You'll passively gain 0.2 charges every second. This isn't really all that noticeable, I mean you'll see it going up slightly, but it's gonna take you a long time if you're doing it passively. It is nice to gain even just the super small amounts when you aren't using your two other methods of gaining it. However, this passive gain will stop happening once you reach 98% of a full charge of Yamoka's Wrath, so you need to use one of the other two methods to get it fully charged. What a great segue into talking about the other two methods for getting charges for Yamoka's Wrath. The first and most obvious is just hitting survivors. Each time you hit a healthy survivor, you will gain 40 charges of your power. Keep in mind that this will only work on uninjured survivors, for the most part, so hitting an already injured survivor won't charge your power. There are a few exceptions to this, however, as pointed out by one of my Twitch viewers, who sadly I can't remember the name of exactly, but thank you for pointing it out to me so I can pass along the knowledge. Basically, it seems that the game checks to see if a survivor is being put into the injured state to see if they should give you charges of Blood Fury or not. This means that if a survivor is exposed and healthy, you're not going to gain any charges from hitting them. However, if a survivor is already injured and has something like Endurance from Borrowed Time or a Styptic, you'll still get charges even if you hit them, despite the fact that they're already injured. Once a survivor is injured from anything, so even if they brought, say, no Mither for some reason, they will begin to drop blood orbs on the ground periodically. Two orbs will spawn naturally from them every four seconds that they remain injured. You will gain two blood orbs when you hook a survivor. Injured survivors will also drop one blood orb every time they crouch. However, this has a one second buffer time to prevent some shenanigans that happened on the PTB. They will drop two blood orbs if they fail a skill check. Remember, only while they are injured. And they will also drop two blood orbs for, quote, game events. What is a game event, you may wonder? Good question. The code says that it's basically anything like dropping a pallet, vaulting a window, exiting a locker, etc. It seems to be pretty much anything that a survivor might be doing in a chase. After becoming unhooked, survivors will have a 10 second grace period where they will not drop any blood orbs at all. You will be able to see the blood orbs floating around in the air when you are within 35 meters of them, and you are shown the aura of blood orbs when within 6 meters of them. By holding down mouse 2, or whatever the console equivalent is, while you are within 6 meters of a blood orb, you will suck them up and absorb them. Each blood orb that you absorb will give you 2.5 charges towards filling out your power meter. While holding down mouse 2, or the console equivalent, to suck up the blood orbs, you will be slowed down to 3.45 meters per second, or 86.135% speed. The blood orbs will be drawn to you while you are within that 6 meters of them, and they have to be at an angle of 45 degrees in front of you. This means that you can suck them up through walls, through ceilings, through floors, as long as they are within 6 meters of you and 45 degrees in front of where you are currently looking while absorbing. They will be drawn to you at a speed of 10 meters per second, or 250% speed. And, by the way, blood orbs last forever, and there are only 100 of them allowed on the map at any given time, 
So if there are 100 and newer ones are spawned, the older ones will be erased. So what happens now that you've actually filled up your power meter, you may be wondering. Well, you will hold out your left hand with all the blood that you've collected, letting both you and survivors know that you're ready to enter into Blood Fury. By holding down left control for a very short amount of time, the actual number, in case you're wondering, is 0.08 seconds, so it's barely noticeable, but you do have to hold it down just the slightest amount, you'll enter into Blood Fury. This will play a 3 second animation, where you'll be unable to perform any action, it's basically a cooldown. Once you've actually entered into your Blood Fury, you will start to lose your power at a rate of negative 2.2 charges per second, meaning you can stay in it for 45.45 seconds, by default. While in Blood Fury, you'll lose the ability to see any blood orbs on the ground. They are still there, however, you just aren't allowed to see them anymore. Once Blood Fury ends, you will have another 3 second cooldown period, where you will put your Kanabo away. While in Blood Fury, you'll unlock two new abilities, Demon Strike and Demon Dash. Let's start off by talking about Demon Strike. Demon Strike is an ability that you can charge up to have a massive lunge that will instantly down any survivor that it hits, and it can hit multiple survivors if they are grouped up for some unknown reason. Demon Strike can be fully charged for 2 seconds and then it will instantly go off, you cannot hold it for longer than that. You can however use a shorter charge to still get the full insta down effect by only holding down the charge for 0.6 seconds, or basically until his hands are glowing red. Now let's talk about the final and probably the best part of the Oni's power, Demon Dash. While in Blood Fury, you can hold down Mouse 2 on PC of course, and after 2 seconds you'll begin sprinting forward at a speed of 7.82 meters per second, or 195.5% speed. During Demon Dash you'll have limited turning speeds, but you will still be able to strafe. You won't bump into objects like Hillbilly, so you are able to control your movement pretty well with practice and get around basically every object, you just can't cut corners extremely quickly. You can either cancel your demon dash by letting go of mouse 2, or use mouse 1 at any time during a demon dash to perform a demon strike with no wind up, but you will still get the increased lunge and insta down capability. If you cancel demon dash manually, by no longer holding down mouse 2 or whatever it is on console, there will be a 1 second cooldown before you are able to act again, and your yaw speed will be limited. Even though there is a loading screen currently in the game as of the writing and making of this video that says that you lose Blood Fury faster while demon dashing, it is incorrect. I tested it and checked the code, there is currently no penalty for demon dashing, so zoom to your heart's content. Whenever you down a survivor while you are in Blood Fury, either with a basic attack, a demon strike, or a demon dash into a demon strike, you will lose 7 seconds of your Blood Fury. If you pick up a downed survivor while Blood Fury is still active, you will lose the effect of Blood Fury, but retain any charges that you had remaining. A fun thing to note is that picking up a survivor and retaining a bit of Blood Fury will actually skip the 3 second cooldown that you normally have from exiting Blood Fury. So it is a somewhat decent idea to save a little bit of time and just pick up down survivors if you only have a few drops left in the old blood bank. Now let's discuss the add-ons that you can equip while playing as the Oni. They've started coding add-ons a bit more differently than before, so some of these might sound a bit odd, since they aren't coded to be percentage increases anymore, they're just flat number increases. Also, I'm going to do what I did with the Spirit video, and start off by apologizing to anyone who actually speaks Japanese, for what I'm about to do in terms of pronouncing some of these words. I'll try my best, but just let me preemptively say, Gomen. We start off with Yakuyoke Talisman. Yakuyoke Talisman will slightly increase the absorption speed of blood orbs. This add-on was a little hard to decipher, but I believe it increases the speed of the blood orbs coming towards you while you're absorbing them by 4 meters per second, bringing it up to 14 meters per second. Next up is Rotting Rope. Rotting Rope will slightly increase the distance at which you can see the aura of your blood orbs. This means an increase of the range at which you can see their auras by 2 meters, bringing it up to 8 meters total. Following that we have Cracked Sakazuki. 
Cracked Sakazuki will slightly increase the activation charge rate and slightly decrease the deactivation time of Blood Fury. The way that Behavior words their add-ons gives me a headache sometimes, I swear they do it on purpose, although I am sure it is probably just a language difference thing. Basically, this add-on will decrease the time it takes to activate Blood Fury, the animation for it, and it will also decrease the cooldown period that you enter when Blood Fury ends by 0.5 seconds each, bringing it down to 2.5 seconds to enter Blood Fury, and a 2.5 second cooldown when Blood Fury ends. And the final common add-on is Blackened Toenail. Blackened Toenail will slightly increase your movement speed while absorbing blood orbs. This means that it will increase your movement speed by 0.3 meters per second, bringing you up to 3.75 meters per second, or 93.75% while gathering those juicy blood orbs. Moving on to the uncommon add-ons for the Oni, we start off with Polished Midate. Oh lord. Polished Midate will moderately increase your blood orb absorption speed. This add-on is actually bugged, and I'm not sure if it's intentional or not, but based on the code, this actually increases your passive charge rate of Blood Fury by 0.1 charges per second, and has nothing at all to do with Blood Orb absorption speed. I don't know if they just forgot to change the text or the code on this one, but it's one or the other, and it currently increases your passive charge rate and has nothing to do with what it actually says but I don't know which it's supposed to be. Next up is Ink Lion. Ink Lion will slightly increase the activation charge rate and slightly decrease the activation time of Blood Fury. It will also moderately decrease the consumption penalty of Blood Fury when downing a survivor. This means once again a poorly worded way of saying that it reduces the time it takes to go into Blood Fury and the cooldown period for exiting Blood Fury. These are the same as Cracked Sakazuki, so half a second each, bringing it down to 2.5 seconds to enter and cool down from Blood Fury. The portion about decreasing your consumption penalty when downing a survivor means a decrease of 2 seconds of Blood Fury, bringing you down to only 5 seconds lost when you down a survivor while Blood Fury is active. Following that we have Chipped Psy High. Chipped Psy High will slightly increase the duration of Blood Fury. This means an increase to your Blood Fury duration of 6 seconds, bringing you up to 51.45 seconds total. Next up is Child's Wooden Sword. Child's Wooden Sword will moderately increase the distance that Blood Orbs can be detected. This means an increase to the range at which you can see the auras of your Blood Orbs by 3 meters, bringing it up to 9 meters total. But remember, once again, you can only absorb them while within 6 meters. And the final uncommon add-on is Bloody Sash. Bloody Sash will moderately increase your movement speed while absorbing blood orbs. This means that it will increase your movement speed by 0.6 meters per second, bringing you up to 4.05 meters per second, or 101.25% speed while sucking up blood orbs. Now let's move on to the Oni's rare add-ons. We start off with Yamoka Sashimono. I think I said that right. Yamoka Sashimono will moderately increase the duration of Blood Fury. This means that it will increase your Blood Fury duration by 8 seconds, bringing you up to 53.45 seconds total. Following that, we have Wooden Oni Mask. Wooden Oni Mask will slightly increase the amount of blood orbs dropped by survivors. This means kind of a lot of things. The major portion of this is that it will increase the frequency in which survivors passively drop blood orbs while injured by 0.5 seconds, making them drop passively every 3.5 seconds. It will also increase the amount of blood orbs they drop for the game events, which is once again dropping pallets, vaulting, exiting lockers, etc. by one orb, making them drop three orbs instead every time they do a quote unquote game event. Next up we have Shattered Wakazashi. Shattered Wakazashi will moderately increase the passive recharge rate of Yamoka's Wrath. This add-on is kind of hilarious, but it will increase your passive recharge rate by 0.2 charges per second, bringing it up to 0.4 charges per second, which is a 100% increase, but still laughably bad considering that you need 
100 charges to actually get Blood Fury, and your passive recharge rate stops at 98%. Then we have Scalped Top Knot. Scalped Top Knot will considerably increase the activation rate to initiate Demon Dash while Blood Fury is active. Good lord. This means it will decrease the amount of time it takes for you to start channeling Demon Dash by one second, bringing it down to one second total. Once again, I think it's a language barrier thing, but these add-ons are worded extremely weirdly. And you literally cannot Demon Dash without having Blood Fury already active, but I'm done nitpicking behaviors wording, honestly. I'm, I'm very sick of it. And the Oni's final rare add-on is Kanai Anzen Talisman. I butchered that one, probably. Kanai Anzen Talisman will moderately increase the movement speed of Demon Dash. This means it will increase your movement speed while Demon Dashing by 0.64 meters per second, bringing your Demon Dash's speed up to 8.46 meters per second, or 211.5% speed, which is getting pretty darn close to Billy speeds of movement. Moving on to the Oni's very rare add-ons, we start off with Tear Soaked Tenugui, I think. Tear Soaked tenu Tenugui? will considerably decrease your consumption penalty of Blood Fury when downing a survivor. This means it will decrease the amount of time lost when downing a survivor by 4 seconds, bringing it down to only a loss of 3 seconds total. Next up is Splintered Hull. Splintered Hull will moderately increase the amount of blood orbs dropped by survivors. This once again means that it will increase the frequency at which survivors passively drop blood orbs by 1 second making them drop the two orbs every three seconds, and also increase the amount of blood orbs dropped from the game events by one orb, making them drop three orbs total per game event. Following that, we have Lion Fang. Lion Fang will considerably increase the duration of Blood Fury. This means an increase to the duration of Blood Fury of 10 seconds, bringing it up to 55.45 seconds total. And the final very rare add-on for the Oni is Akito's Crutch. Akito's Crutch will considerably increase the movement speed of Demon Dash. This means an increase to your speed while Demon Dashing of 1 meter per second, bringing you up to 8.82 meters per second, or 220.5% total speed, which is just slightly slower than Billy's base speed while chainsaw sprinting, which is pretty cool. Now let's cover the Oni's two ultra rare add-ons. We start off with Renjiro's Bloody Glove. Renjiro's Bloody Glove will allow survivors to be able to see blood orbs that are dropped while they are within 4 meters of them, as well as revealing a survivor's aura for 3 seconds if they touch a blood orb. This add-on is pretty bonkers and somewhat the same as the Plague's Black Incense where it just passively gives you auras of survivors around the map from time to time. This is a pretty strong add-on, and worth running almost for sure. There is a grace period of 0.5 seconds from when a blood orb will actually spawn, and when the survivors are actually allowed to collide with them, so they can somewhat get out of the way of the blood orbs, but for the most part you're going to be seeing a lot of auras if you're running Renjiro's Bloody Glove. And the Oni's final ultra rare add-on, and his final add-on in general, is Iridescent Family Crest. Iridescent Family Crest will make it so that when you miss a demon strike, all survivors within a 12 meter range of you will scream and reveal their locations to you for 4 seconds. Given how long of an animation you have for missing a demon strike, and how small of a radius 12 meters actually is, I don't really think this is worth using, since you can kind of just use your eyes for the most part, but maybe I'm completely wrong, I don't know. So let's talk about some tips for playing the Oni. I think one of the most important things to know while playing the Oni is how to get a first hit. So you're going to want to learn the typical spawn patterns in Dead by Daylight to maximize your ability to just get that first hit and get your power up and running, so you can crush survivors quickly and quite literally. The quick and dirty explanation of how spawns work is that survivors will typically spawn within a few meters of a generator and on roughly the opposite side of the map for you. This is a bit hard to tell on maps that aren't exactly linear, like not every map is Azure's resting place. 
some maps like the game, it's kind of hard to tell where the opposite side of the map is, but just know that they'll spawn on a generator that typically is pretty far away from you. This means that when a match starts, if you just start patrolling towards the farthest generator from you, and going, you know, hopping generator to generator, just kind of playing connect to the generators, you'll typically find survivors pretty quickly and be able to get those first few hits in to get them injured, get the blood orbs, get your power charged up, and start smashing. One thing that I do want to mention, because people gave me flack for not mentioning it in my Demogorgon video, is just how loud the Oni is. Survivors can hear pretty much everything that you do all over the map. They hear a sound cue when your power is fully charged, they can hear you screaming out when you're entering Blood Rage, or when you're demon dashing. As I said, they'll basically be able to hear you all the way on the other side of the map. So keep that in mind while you're using your power and getting it charged up. You aren't exactly the most subtle killer. Something to keep in mind as well is that you don't need to fully charge your demon strike to be able to use them. You only have to charge it for about 0.6 seconds. The easiest tell for when it is charged and ready to go is that your hands will glow red when you're about to smash and or bash. Also remember that you can use demon strike to break pallets so using it to not respect pallets will typically either lead to the survivor not dropping the pallet and getting downed, or dropping the pallet and you just break it easily as if you had a fully revved chainsaw. Also, you can use your demon strike to hit multiple survivors at once. So if you do see a survivor diving a hook, if you can time it right, you can get down there, hit them both, and down the savior and either trigger borrowed time, or down the unhooked survivor as well. A very, very big thing to know, and something I did not know when I started on the PTB, is that you can strafe and turn while in Demon Dash, and you don't have any penalty for running into objects. So you need to get a hang for strafing and turning while navigating the map. And if you do get a hang of this, you'll be able to navigate the map fairly easily compared to, say, Billy, because you don't have to worry about bumping into things and you have that extra strafing ability while Demon Dashing. This is really one of the Oni's strongest points, the fact that you can dash around the entire map without bumping into any things. There's only a one second cooldown if you manually cancel it. You can strafe and turn, which means you can cut corners somewhat easier than Billy, but not as easy if you were just walking. And obviously you're going to want to be chaining your demon dashes into insta downs with demon strike. Um, but if you need to in a pinch, you can just use it to kind of get around the map and you can use it at some loops to cut them short, but that's something you'll have to practice and get a feel for. Speaking of using it at loops, another thing that you'll want to practice and get a feel for is using what is called flicking with your demon strikes, either demon strikes on their own or after demon dashes. You have a bit of a grace period while you're in the animation of actually swinging your kanabo, I believe it's pronounced, to quote unquote flick the demon strike in case the survivors weren't dead center and they either dodged left or right. This can be really hard to get a feel for, as you might have noticed from the background footage of me playing. I'm not very good at it. You might find yourself overshooting, but you can actually use your flick to basically go around corners and get hits, almost 180 to get hits sometimes, and mastering flicks of demon strikes I think is going to be the biggest factor for being a either a subpar oni player or a fantastic oni player i think this this is where most of the skill ceiling lies is in flicking your demon strikes another thing to remember is that you move extremely slowly while absorbing blood orbs so if you're in the middle of a chase you probably should not be slurping up orbs unless you're almost fully charged you can wait until you've downed someone or you can try and keep track of where there might be large stockpiles of blood orbs from injured survivors working on generators or running a certain loop over and over again. If you can keep track of these large stockpiles, you may be able to chain your blood furies back to back somewhat easily because you'll have it end and then you'll know, hey, there's like 50 orbs on that generator that they've been working on. So maybe you go over there, you just absorb all the blood orbs, you've got your blood fury back and you demon dash right back into the action with barely any downtime. So now let's talk about the pretty laughable, teachable perks that you'll be unlocking if you put your blood points into the Oni. At level 30, you will unlock the teachable for Zanshin Tactics. Zanshin Tactics will reveal the auras of all pallets and vault spots 
within 24 meters of you. Whenever you damage a survivor, Zanshin Tactics will go on cooldown for 40 slash 35 slash 30 seconds. At level 35, you'll unlock the teachable for the perk Blood Echo. Blood Echo will make it so whenever you hook a survivor, all other injured survivors will suffer from the hemorrhage status effect until healed, and also the exhaustion status effect for 45 seconds. This effect has a cooldown of 80 slash 70 slash 60 seconds. And finally, at level 40, you will unlock the teachable for the perk Nemesis. Nemesis will make it so that anytime a survivor blinds you or stuns you, whether it be with a locker, a pallet, or a decisive strike, they will become the obsession, as well as gain the oblivious status effect for 40 slash 50 slash 60 seconds, and have their aura revealed to you for 4 seconds. Please note that while Nemesis does say that any time the survivors change the obsessions, it will trigger this oblivious status effect and aura reveal, it has been tested multiple times by multiple people, and it only triggers off of Nemesis's own action. It doesn't trigger off of things like furtive chase. So keep in mind, Nemesis will only ever trigger Nemesis. Nothing else will trigger Nemesis as of the making of this video at the very least. So let's talk about what perks you're going to probably want to be running while playing the Oni. Since he's fairly new, I'm not going to say what a full quote unquote meta build is like I normally would. I'm instead just going to talk about some perks that I think fit his playstyle and his power well. The first two are the obvious ones, Barbecue and Chili and Hex Ruin. While the Oni does have a pretty strong snowball game, his early game is pitiful, laughably pitiful. And Hex Ruin will help you slow down the game enough, hopefully, to be able to get your first Blood Fury up and running and get the snowball rolling. If you don't like Hex Ruin, you might want to substitute in, say, Corrupt Intervention instead, just to block off generators and kind of funnel those survivors to you for the first hit. The first hit is very, very important. Barbecue and Chili will give you an idea of where you should go once you have your power back up and running, and after you've downed and hooked a survivor. Plus, the extra PP is kind of fantastic, let's be honest. Other perks to consider running that will help you either keep survivors injured or snowball harder with your Blood Fury active. Those are the perks that you're going to want to be looking for. The major perks, in my opinion, to consider are Sloppy Butcher to keep survivors injured, Monitor and Abuse to be able to get closer to survivors before they hear your tear radius and run away, which will help you get that first hit initially, or possibly sneak up in the middle of the game. Discordance to help you find multiple survivors early to get that Blood Fury powered up, since you do require two hits on survivors or a hit and then absorbing a lot of blood orbs. A Nurse's Calling will also help you be able to see the auras of healing survivors, since one of the biggest counters to the Oni is survivors just healing extremely quickly, and this will help you punish them and keep them injured so you can keep the blood orbs rolling. And the final perk to consider would be Infectious Fright, which will help you snowball out of control when you demon strike people while in Blood Fury. Monitor and Abuse works extremely well with Infectious Fright to help you snowball, so you might want to try combining those together. And obviously Sloppy Butcher will keep them healing longer, which means that Nurse's Calling will work extremely well with Sloppy Butcher. So you might want to consider running those two sets of perks together instead of just running one or the other or, you know, scattering them here and about. So let's say a sample build for the Oni would look something like this. Barbecue and Chili, Hex Ruin, Monitor and Abuse, and Infectious Fright. This way you can get your first hit easier due to the slowdown from Ruin in the early game and the reduced terror radius from Monitor. Plus, when you do start snowballing, your Infectious Fright will have an increased radius to cause screams so you know where survivors are around you to go hit them. If Infectious fails to work, you can always use Barbecue and Chili to track down farther away survivors to get the next hits and either get Blood Fury charged up faster or start snowballing harder. So now let's talk about everybody's favorite part of these videos, the meme builds. Coming up with these was a little tough considering how pretty vanilla the Oni's add-ons are, but here are two that I could come up with. The first is probably the most obvious one, but I am going to call it Initial D Oni, because he's Japanese. For this build, you're going to want to bring the add-ons Akito's Crutch and Kanai Anzen Talisman. For perks, you're going to want to bring your favorite perks, but if you want to go truly, truly fast, you can bring Play With Your Food and get it 3 stacked for extra 15% movement speed. 
This way your demon dash will be more like a demon AE86. Just get your blood orbs, get your hits, and then hit the gas, gas, gas. The other meme build would be like a blood orb overload build, or something cooler naming that I can't come up with. For this build, you're probably going to want to bring some healing slowdown add-ons, such as Sloppy Butcher, Thanatophobia, Nurse's Calling, something along those lines. For add-ons, you're going to want to bring Wooden Oni Mask and Splintered Hull to increase how many Blood Orb survivors drop for the game events and how quickly they will passively drop them. This way, the map will just be filled to the brim with Blood Orbs and you'll probably get, honestly, 100 and you'll get maxed out, but whatever. You'll be able to get your Blood Fury charged up super quickly and be able to just chain those Blood Furies back to back to back to back to back. And that's it for this episode of Entity Education, covering Kazan Yamoka, probably better known as the Oni, although don't let him catch you saying that or he'll rip your tongue out. If you like this video, feel free to leave a like, leave a comment with what perks you personally run on the Oni, or how you feel like you should play him. Um, all of my social media stuff is up on the screen right now. Thank you as always for watching, and if you don't mind me, I have some Oni to go play, because he's way too much fun and I, I honestly can't help myself. I've just been having fun playing him, even if I lose and I don't run add-ons or whatever. I'll see you in the next episode covering whoever the next killer is. Goodbye.